countenance. Um, that lifted my heart to the heights of heaven. And what a joy it is for us to blend our voices together. And there's a sense in which there's a vertical and a horizontal aspect to congregational singing. Vertically, we're singing to the Lord. But horizontally, we're encouraging one another as we sing to the Lord. And it ministers to me to hear you sing. And it is a thrill to my heart. Thank you, Josh, for leading us in that. Well, for this last session uh, of the evening, uh, the topic that has been assigned to me is genuine faith and its fruit. Is that what's up? Yeah, there it is. <laughs> I saw everyone looking behind me, Uh, genuine faith and its fruit. So we need a passage, don't we? So let's, if you would, take your Bible and turn with me to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, to a passage that you know very well, and it's going to be a a launching point, really. Uh, This will be much more of a a topical message than what I normally do, which is a verse-by-verse exposition. But I think it will allow us to say some things tonight that really need to be said. So I want to begin by reading Ephesians chapter 2 and specifically verses 8 through 10. Verses 8 through 10. The Apostle Paul, writing as he's in prison in Rome, the year 60 or 61 AD, writing to the church in Ephesus, and he writes, For by grace... You have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. In these verses, we see stated what is the title of this message. We, we see genuine saving faith in, in verse 8. You are saved through faith. That's saving faith. And we see the fruit in verse 10, that we have been saved for good works. Uh, there's really three prepositional phrases in these verses Uh, that I want to draw your attention to, we are saved by grace, through faith, for good works. Uh, To put it another way, faith is the root and good works is the fruit. Um, The Reformers used to say, faith alone saves, but faith that is alone does not save. And by that, they meant all true saving faith is life-changing. All true saving faith is following Jesus Christ in a really dramatic takeover of your life. And so the question here by way of introduction is, so what is genuine saving faith? Uh, The Bible does talk about a non-saving faith. That's in John 2. 23 to 25, there is a faith that does not save. And James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, talks about a dead faith, a non-saving faith. But the Bible also speaks of faith in a, in a true way. And so what is genuine, true, saving faith? Well, to begin with, and still just by way of introduction, I want to talk just for a moment about what it's not, because negative denial helps us understand positive assertion. Uh, Saving faith is not positive thinking. It's not optimism. Uh, It is not naming it and claiming it. It is not profession is possession. It is not mere head knowledge. It is not agreeing with creeds and confessions or your church's doctrinal statement. It is not mere emotions for God and Christ. It is not even professing Christ. You're not saved by professing Christ. You are saved by possessing 
Christ. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. You can profess Christ from now until you're, you're, you're blue in the face. That doesn't mean you know Christ. A saving faith is, is not in agreement with historical facts in the Bible. A saving faith is not even mere belief that the Bible is God's Word. The Bible wasn't crucified for you on a cross. The Bible was not raised from the dead for you from a tomb. A saving faith is not walking an aisle. It's not even praying a prayer necessarily. Saving faith is none of these things. So, what is saving faith? It's a very important question because churches are filled with non-saving faith. What are the marks of true saving faith? Well, what I want to do in this session is to give you 10 words that will be distinguishing marks of true saving faith, okay? Word number one, supernatural. Saving faith is a supernatural work of God in a spiritually dead soul that is regenerated by the Spirit of God. Saving faith is not natural, it is supernatural. What is natural is unbelief. What is supernatural is saving faith. And because of the biblical teaching of total depravity and radical corruption, I I hope you're familiar with those terms, left to yourself, you would never believe. You would never believe. Before saving faith, we were all spiritually dead. I remember the day in seminary when the professor asked this question, and it totally radically changed my worldview. He just asked this question, what can a dead man do? And I was waiting for someone to answer him. (laughs) And a fellow student on the back row, I'll never forget it, he yelled out, stink. (laughs) That's all a dead man can do. Dead man can't see. Dead man can't hear. Dead man can't move. Dead men can't believe. That is why we must be regenerated by the Spirit of God in order to believe. We'll come back to that later. But regeneration precedes faith and regeneration produces faith. It has to be that way because dead men don't believe. Ephesians 2 verse 1, we were dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. John 6, verse 44 says, no one can come to me. Now, you know the difference between can and may? May is a word of permission. Can is a word of ability. Jesus did not say, no one may come to me. No, the invitation of the gospel goes out far and wide. It's just that no one can answer it. They, have, they are plagued by spiritual inability. And in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Paul writes that Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Hello. If you can't see it, you can't believe in it. So saving faith must be a divine intervention. It must be a sovereign work of God's grace in the spiritually dead human heart. So saving faith is a grace gift. It is a gift of God's grace. It must be given to us to believe. Why didn't you believe earlier? Because God didn't give it to you earlier. There is an appointed time in which each of the elect believe in Jesus Christ. And it is when, among many things that take place in the order salutis, the order of salvation, It is at that moment when you believe as a result of the Holy Spirit. And so let's let's look at our our text here, 2 Corinthians 
excuse me, Ephesians 2 and verse 8, it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Do you see that in your Bible? For by grace you have been saved through faith. So where did that faith come from? Continue to read. And that not of ourselves, faith did not come from ourselves. It is the gift of God. And I know someone will say, no, 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 that's referring to grace, and I'll agree, grace is from God. But anyone who knows grammar and syntax knows that the closest antecedent to the gift of God in this sentence is not grace, it's faith. If it points back to anything earlier in the verse... It points to faith before it even points back to grace. You see, faith is not something that we work up within us. It is something that has to come down from above. It has to come from the throne of grace. Uh, Turn over to Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, just for a moment. Philippians 1, verse 29, because we're so close in the neighborhood. Paul writes, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, to be granted something, it's it's given to you, watch, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Do you see that? You see, it had to be given to us to believe. It, It didn't come from within, it came from above. It came from the all-loving, gracious hand of God to give to us what we could never have done in and of ourselves. Not only has He given to us the Savior, but He has given to us the faith to believe in the Savior. That is why Romans eleven thirty six 36 says, for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, I love this verse, it says, looking unto Jesus, comma, the author and perfecter of faith. Now, who authored faith in you? Are you the author of your own faith? No. Jesus is the author of your saving faith. And here is what is so wonderful. Listen to this. All faith in Jesus is is with a faith from Jesus. He's working both ends of the aisle. All faith in Jesus is a faith that has come from Jesus. In 2 Peter 1, verse 1, Peter writes, quote, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. You see, you have to receive faith. Acts 3, verse 16, again says, all faith in Christ is from and through Christ. So, we're beginning this, what is saving faith? We just need to understand that it is a, it is supernatural. It it is God doing something in your heart and in your soul that you could have never done by yourself or in, in association with God, God did it all. He did it all. Second word, commitment. Saving faith is a strong and firm commitment of your entire life to Jesus Christ. It's not half in, half out. It's all the way in, committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 6, verse 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes, listen to this, in me, he who believes in me will never thirst. Uh, Some verses in the Bible say that we are to believe in Jesus, and it's a little preposition, E-N, that you just believe in him. Another is believe upon him. In the original language, in this verse, it's a different preposition, which most literally means into. You have to believe into the Lord Jesus Christ, and it it speaks of what a commitment it is that you believe all the way into the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I flew down here this afternoon from Dallas, Texas. 
Um, I had a boarding pass. Um, I went to the gate, A37. Um, they began to call for people to get on the plane. Um, I saw people that went ahead of me in wheelchairs and with walkers. Uh, they got on the plane. Uh, they, they, they called for the big flyers to, to get on the plane. And then it came time for me. And I walked up to uh, the door of the plane. And I have to go all the way into the plane if I'm going to come to Houston, right? Well, you're going to have to go all the way into Jesus if you're going to go to heaven. You just can't have your toes up to the gate. Uh, you can't just stand on the outside of the plane and watch everybody else get on and admire. You believe, yeah, that's a real plane right there. Uh, I, I've, I've seen it. Other people uh, have, have been on this plane before. No, you're going to have to make a commitment to take that step of faith and to cross the line and to enter into that plane just like you must come all the way to saving faith in Jesus Christ. It's also in John 3.16, maybe the most well-known verse in the entire Bible. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes into Him will not perish but have everlasting life. And so saving faith is a firm, strong commitment to Jesus Christ. It means to be sold out to Jesus it means to live with loyalty to Jesus, with allegiance to Jesus. It means to be dedicated to Jesus. It means to be devoted to Jesus. There is no easy believism. You're either in or you're out. And to be in, you have to believe into the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember when, when I was married, um, my 40th anniversary is get, getting ready to, to come up. And I remember standing there at the, at the head of the church and my bride-to-be coming down the aisle. I made a commitment to her I, that I will be committed to you in sickness and in health, in riches or in poverty. I am forsaking everyone else, all those legions of old girlfriends. <laughs> I, I am forsaking them. I'm forsaking anyone in the future. You're the only one, and I am committing to you my life to be one with you and to live with you and to provide for you and to, to care for you, and I want that same commitment to me. That's what saving faith is. You take Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. It, it is a firm commitment. Third, repentant. All true saving faith has repentance in it. Saving faith is a repentant faith. When Jesus began his public ministry in Mark 1 and verse 15, he said, repent and believe the gospel. And by saying repent and believe, we clearly see that repentance and faith are the heads and tails of the same coin. Now, you can't have one without the other. And repentance is really a turning away from sin and self-righteousness and self-trust. It's a turning away from all of your feeble efforts to commend yourself to God. It is turning away with a broken spirit from the broad path headed for destruction and a life pursuit of sin, it is a turning away from that, and then saving faith is a turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you turn one, you turn the other. When you turn away from, you turn to. All true saving faith turns its back on the world, turns its back on a life pursuit of sin, and turns the heart and the soul to the only Savior there is, Jesus Christ. Repentance is really the, the, the repentance that 
is, is intertwined with true saving faith. Let me say it again. Wherever there is true saving faith, there is repentance. In fact, many places in the Bible, repentance is used uh, almost as a synonym for saving faith. John the Baptist, when he preached in Matthew 3, verse 5, said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, in order to enter into the kingdom, you must repent of your sins or you cannot enter. Now, Jesus said the very same in Matthew 4 and verse 17. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do you desire to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Do you desire to enter into the sphere of salvation and into the realm of redemption? Then it is absolutely necessary that you have a repentant faith. And Jesus said later in Luke 13 and verse 3, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. If you do not repent, you're going to hell. If you do not repent, you you will suffer the torment of the damned in hell forever. Repentance is absolutely essential to true saving faith. And in the Great Commission in Luke 24 and verse 47, as Jesus commissioned his his disciples to go out and preach, he charged them to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sin. There is no forgiveness of sin without repentance. That was at the tip of their spear in the, in the book of Acts. As you read their preaching, it is again and again and again and again and again, they called for repentance. In fact, you remember on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 and verse 37, Peter is preaching and they interrupted the sermon and they said, what must we do? What did Peter say? Repent. That's no time to fumble the ball. That's no time to mess up an evangelistic uh, uh, offer. That is the time to nail it. And 3,000 souls were saved because they heard the truth. And because they responded to the truth, and they turned away from their dead religion, and they turned away from the evil world system, and they turned with repentance to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were converted. In the next chapter, in Acts 3, verse 19, Peter again, after healing the, uh, the, the paralyzed man, said, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away. What is necessary in your life, for you to have your sins wiped away, for God to cancel out the certificate of debt that that He has against you with the list of all of your crimes committed against Him, it is necessary that you repent. And if that were not enough, the Apostle Paul on Mars Hill in Acts 17 and verse 30, and I'm just establishing and underscoring for you how essential and how non-negotiable repentance is as a part of saving faith. Paul said, God is is now declaring to men. Not even Paul, not even Peter, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Close quote. As he gave that message to that unconverted uh, gathering there on, on Mars Hill, repentance is a change of mind, metanoia. It is a change of heart, and it is a change of will. It is the turning of the whole person. It's not just the turning of the mind. It's the turning of the heart and the turning of the will. And so repentance and faith always travel together. They are always arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder. Wherever you find the one, you will find the other. They are Siamese twins joined at the hip. Repentance and faith. So the question is, as you share the gospel, do you share it like Jesus shared the gospel? 
Do you do so as Peter preached, as Paul preached? They were big on repentance. Parents, when you talk to your children, grandparents, when you talk to your grandchildren, do you call for repentance, a turning away from their own self-efforts with conviction of sin and brokenness and a turning to God? And have you repented? Because it is necessary to exercise true saving faith. Now, let's continue to walk through this. Fourth, submissive. All saving faith is marked by humble submission under the lordship of Jesus Christ. The word submission comes from two Latin words, sub, obviously, meaning under, like a submarine is under the water, and and mito means to put something in place. And so the word submission means putting oneself under the authority of another. Saving faith is the surrender and submission of one's life to the kingship of Jesus Christ. You remember in Luke chapter 14, verses 31 and 32, and Jesus told a parable about uh, a king who had 10,000 soldiers, and another king is coming against him with, what is it, 20,000 soldiers, something like that. And the king with the smaller army realizes, I can't go into battle against this king. He will destroy me. And that coming king with the greater number of soldiers is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself on the day of judgment. And the king with the lesser numbers was everyone to whom Jesus was speaking that day in Luke chapter 14. And Jesus then says, that the king with the fewer troops must send out a delegate and accept the terms of peace made by the greater king. And he must surrender to the greater king or he will be slaughtered. And so it is in true saving faith. Listen, we come under the authority of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In, for example, Acts 16 and verse 30, the Philippian jailer said, Sirs, what must we do to be saved? Remember the answer? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Now, what if I came to your house tonight, knocked on the door, and you said, who's there? I said, have you already forgotten? (laughs) Steve Lawson. (laughs) What if you said, well, Steve, come on in, but Lawson, you stay out. I, I can't come in. I don't come in halves. It's all of me or none of me. And when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot say, Come in, Jesus, into my life, but Lord, you stay out. No, Jesus cannot come that way. These two names are inseparably bound, and to believe in the Lordship of Jesus Christ means that you recognize His right to rule your life, that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you must come in humble submission as you would exercise true saving faith. Romans 10 verse 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You must confess the lordship of Jesus Christ just like you must believe in the resurrection of of Jesus Christ. You may find it interesting in the book of Acts, with the apostolic preaching, Jesus is only referred to as Savior two times. He is referred to as Lord 99 times. 
What was the emphasis of that first century church? It was to call for submission under the lordship of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 11, verse 29, Jesus issued the gospel. He says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Then he says, verse 29, that was verse 28, now verse 29, take my yoke upon you. Now, what does it mean to take the yoke of Jesus? It means to come under and into the yoke of Jesus where he is now your master. And when he pulls to the left, you go to the left. And when he pulls to the right, you go to the right. And when he pulls back on the range, you stop. And when he cracks the whip, you go. You now have a new master. You have come and taken the yoke of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what unbelief does? Unbelief leaves you as stiff-necked. You know what it means to be stiff-necked? That that's when an oxen hunches up its shoulders so that the yoke cannot be put around its neck. And he can refuse and he can resist the yoke by being stiff-necked. But true saving faith is you actually stop being stiff-necked. And you humble yourself in that decisive moment and come under the lordship of Jesus Christ. So submission is an essential element of true saving faith. Now let me add another. Number five, obedient. All true saving faith is an obedient faith disobedient faith must be the ultimate oxymoron. It's like a dead live oak. It's just, a, it's just an oxymoron, a freezer burn. It's just an oxymoron. No, there is no such thing as disobedient faith. There's only a heavenly devil. There's only a saved Methodist. I mean, you know. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I grew up, I grew up in the Methodist church. Okay. <laughs> now, where were you? Where were we before you interrupted me? <laughs> Here, here's what you need to understand. The gospel comes to you and to me as a free offer, right? It comes as an invitation, okay? It comes as an appeal, but it's more than that. It comes as a command. You and I are commanded with the imperative mood, repent, believe in the gospel. And so saving faith is actually a, the first step of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me show you a great verse. I'm going to let you turn to it. John chapter 3, so you know it's going to be good. John chapter 3, verse 36. Last verse in John chapter 3. It'll be worth turning to. John chapter 3, verse 36. Are you there? All right, what I want you to see is the parallelism in this verse. There is an A line and a B line, okay? Here is the A line. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. Now, when you come to the B line, there is a, an interchange of, of words that are synonymous. It's called synonymous parallelism. And at the end of verse 36, he says, but... He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Believe, and you're saved. Not obey, you're under the wrath of God. All true saving faith is the first step of a lifetime of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
yes, once we go down that path, there are times when we do not obey, but he has a wonderful way of bringing us back to the place of obedience because he desires obedience from his people. Saving faith is the first step of obedience to Christ. Matthew 7, verse 13, enter through the narrow gate. That's, that's not a pretty please. That, that's not a suggestion. That's not a, on his wish list for you. That is a command. That is an imperative. And so, saving faith, you obey. Unbelief, you disobey. In Matthew 8, verse 22, Jesus said, follow me. It calls for an obedient response. In Matthew 9, verse 9, he went to Levi, the tax collector, and said, follow me. And he got up and followed him. To leave behind his tax booth was repentance. To take that step of obedience to the call, follow me, was saving faith. So all true saving faith is obedient. And I trust that you have obeyed the call of the gospel, the command of the gospel, for you to come to Christ by faith and no longer be stiff-necked, but to surrender and submit your life to the kingship of Jesus. Now, number six, immediate. It, it begins at a point in time. One moment you are in unbelief, and the next moment you have exercised saving faith. As saving faith as it is first exercised in the Lord in the, at the moment of conversion, it doesn't take place over three months. It, it doesn't take place over the summer or over the winter. There is a specific time, a specific moment, a specific day in which, in which you have believed in Jesus Christ. Now, you may not be able to identify what that time was, but it did nevertheless take place at a moment in time. Let me give you an example, a couple examples. Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. In verse 1, it says it was the day of Pentecost had come. And in verse 40 of that chapter, Peter said, be saved from this perverse generation. Verse 41, so then those who received his word were baptized and were added to their number. So when were they saved? On the day of Pentecost. Not in, not in the month of Pentecost. Not, not in the year of Pentecost. Not in the decade of Pentecost. They were saved in the day of Pentecost. When, when they came to celebrate this, this feast, they were lost. They were in unbelief. They, they were unconverted. They were unregenerated. And Peter said, be saved and repent. And 3,000 in that day were added to their number. Let, let me make it even more clear. At the end of that chapter, Acts chapter 2, verse 47, it says that the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Some were saved on Monday. Some were saved on Tuesday. Others were saved on Wednesday. Yet others were saved on Thursday. There was a day. There was a moment. There was a time when they believed in Jesus Christ. And that was true in your life. Even if you can't draw a circle around what that date was, I want you to know it was one step of faith by which you went from outside the kingdom to inside the kingdom. Think of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Philip hops up into that chariot with him, explains Isaiah chapter 53. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. And he believed that moment. Think of Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus road. And Christ suddenly appeared to him. 
and knocked him off his high horse. And in that moment, he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the point. Saving faith is an immediate step. It's a punctiliar step. It takes place in a decisive, defining moment in a person's life. And I think one reason some people really don't know if they're in or out and they lack assurance of their salvation is because they've sat under such weak preaching. They don't know if they're in or out. I mean, you don't know that you've been raised from the dead. You you don't know that you're a new creature in Christ. You, you, You don't know that you've left the kingdom of darkness and now you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, and you don't know that? The only way you couldn't know that is you sat under such blurred lines of distinction that you got just enough to get in, but not enough to figure it out, really, when that happened. Let me give you a seventh comprehensive. Saving faith is comprehensive in that it involves the whole person. Mind, affections or emotions, and will. Uh, the The reformers differentiated it in this way. There has to be the knowledge of content. You you have to know the gospel. You have to know Jesus is the Savior who has died upon the cross to bear your sins. You have to know He's been raised from the dead. You, You have to know that you must repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. There must be this head knowledge of the gospel that you are a great sinner and He is a great Savior. In fact, He's an even greater Savior than you are a great sinner. That's in the mind. And that's where it starts. No one will ever be saved until they know the truth. Second, the affections, the emotions. There must be the conviction that this is true. There must be the conviction that this is what I need. There must be the, the, the conviction of the certainty and the trustworthiness of what you have heard intellectually to be the very truth of God. And you must desire it. You must, you must come to that place of repentance where you now hate your sin and you love Christ. But there's one more step. Because the Bible says in James chapter chapter 2, the demons, the devils believe. That's cognitive head knowledge. And they tremble in fear. That's emotions. There's got to be this third and final. There must be the commitment of the will. There must be the stepping forward to put your trust in Him. Romans 10, verse 9, hear it again. Believe, you must believe in your heart. Heart there referring to your whole inner person, not just your emotions. The Bible is using it here as all that you are on the inside. That's that's comprehensive. Your mind, your affections, your desires, and your will. And so there must be the exercise of your will to believe in Jesus Christ. No one else can believe for you. Your parents cannot believe for you. Your spouse cannot believe for you. Your parents cannot believe for you. God will not even believe for you. You must believe. You must take that decisive step and commit your life. Now, you would do that with the faith that He gives you, but nevertheless, you are involved. It's comprehensive. Your whole being believes upon Christ. Think of it this way. The heart of faith 
believes in Christ. The hand of faith lays hold of Christ. The eye of faith looks to Christ. That was Spurgeon's text by which he was converted. Look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. It is the eye of faith looking away from yourself and looking away from this world, and by faith looking to Christ who alone can save. The feet of faith come to Christ. The arms of faith receive Christ. The mouth of faith calls upon Christ. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The mouth of faith feeds on Christ. You must eat His flesh and drink His blood, Jesus said, or you have no part in me. From the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, every inch and every ounce of you, by faith, you must be all in with Christ. You, 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 you can't just have a part of your life to be given to Christ. It is the entirety of your soul, the entirety of your life given to Christ. F-A-I-T-H, the acrostic, forsaking all, I trust Him. That is what it is. And so have you believed in a comprehensive way. Nothing held back, nothing off limits, nothing out of bounds from the Lord. You're all in with Christ because you have believed into Christ. There's none of you left behind. You're all in Christ. Now, we'll wrap this up. Number eight, and this is a really good point. <laughs> Irrevocable. R.C. Sproul used to tell me certain words just sound good. <laughs> this is one of those. Irrevocable. I, I really want you to chew on this. True saving faith will always believe. A believer will never become an unbeliever. Write that down in capital letters, large font, bold type, underline it and get a yellow highlighter and overscore it. Put a spotlight on it. Tattoo it on the inside of your eyelids. A believer will never, ever, ever become an unbeliever. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, we, we, we remember so-and-so got all excited about the Lord, and he joined the church, and, man, he was just like a tornado for Jesus. I mean, he was just everywhere, and then he got his feelings hurt or something, and he's nowhere to be found, and the next thing you hear, he's, he's down at the Jehovah's Witness Lodge. So, was he saved and lost his salvation? No, he was never saved to begin with. Understand this, the faith that fizzles before the finish had a flaw from the first. <laughs> Say that ten times quickly. <laughs> <laughs> the faith that fizzles before the finish had a flaw from the first. It was a counterfeit faith. You can read Matthew 13, it was that soil where, that, where the... The, 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 the seed just popped up so quickly, but then it fell away. No, true saving faith perseveres, listen to this, all the way to the end. Spurgeon said, Noah fell down many times in the ark, but never once fell out of the ark. All right, so let me give you a verse. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. All faith that Jesus authors in the dead soul that's been made alive in regeneration, he perfects it all the way to the end. He starts it, he continues it, he upholds it, he sustains it, he completes it all the way to the end. Philippians 1, verse 6, 
Being confident in this very thing. You need to be confident in this very thing. That he who began a good work in you shall perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. What is the good work that he began in you? It's several things. I don't have time to take us through the book of Philippians, but at the head of the list is giving you saving faith. That's the good work he began in you. Along with a spiritual circumcision where he cut your heart and, and, and opened, cut it deep in repentance and, and opened it up for you to believe and then put saving faith in you. He who began a good work shall perfect it until the day of Jesus. Here's a great verse. Romans 1, verse 16 and 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the it referring back to the gospel, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. Now here comes the knockout punch. From faith to faith. Now what does that mean? Over the centuries of church history, there have been 10, 12 different interpretations of that. I'll tell you exactly what it means. From faith to faith means the faith that he starts will be the faith he completes in you. It's from faith to faith to faith to faith to faith. That faith will never stop believing. This is an important point we're making here. Hebrews 3 verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if... We hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. It's the perseverance of the saints, which is in reality the perseverance of the Savior in the saints, which in reality is the perseverance of the Savior giving a persevering faith in the saints. It's an inside job. It's all a work of God. Let me give you one more verse. This point is so important. John 8, verse 31. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. The faith that fizzles before the finish had a flaw from the first. But if you've got the real deal, you will continue because the Lord is in you. And the Lord will sustain you and perfect the faith that he authored. All right, very quickly. Number nine, dynamic. True saving faith is dynamic. It is, it is a living faith. It, 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 is, uh, it is a faith that pursues Christ. It is a faith that follows Christ. It's not a faith that just stays where you were once. No, you've left that behind. You now are moving out to follow Christ. Saving faith is never passive. It never just sits there. True saving faith is never stagnant. It is never inactive. It never goes on a sabbatical. It's, it, it's not a mere spectator. True saving faith puts you in the game. Faith in Christ always follows after Christ. And I just want to nail this down with, with two verses that are back-to-back. -back. Luke 14, 26 and 27. I'll just do this very quickly. Luke 14, 26 says, If anyone comes to me, to come to Christ is to take that decisive step of faith and to come all the way to Christ. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and brother and sister, spouse, children, he cannot. He cannot. He cannot be my disciple. Either Jesus is number one on the list and you love him more than life itself, or you're going to have to find another line to get in. 
Next verse. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. In verse 26, you come to Christ. In verse 27, you come after Christ. It's a package deal. Everyone who genuinely, truly comes to Christ will begin a life of coming after Christ. You will follow Christ on the narrow path. So, true saving faith is not just empty head knowledge and checking some boxes, praying a prayer, walking an aisle, all of that. No. True saving faith propels you forward to follow Christ. Now, here's my last point. Number, number 10, essential. We've heard that word a lot. All I want to tell you, faith is essential. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to come to Christ. Without faith, it is impossible to be converted. Without faith, it is impossible to be saved. Without faith, it is impossible to have a right standing with God. Without faith, it is impossible to go to heaven. Saving faith is that necessary. And except you believe, you'll never please God. And you'll never find acceptance with God until you come to that place where you commit your life with obedient faith and repentance to him. So, here's the question. Have you, you, not the person to your left, not the person to your right, have you believed in Jesus Christ? Have you forsaken all self-trust in all self-righteousness, and put your whole trust in Jesus Christ. Have you repented of your sins? Have you humbled yourself and submitted your life under the lordship of Jesus Christ? Have you recognized his right to rule your life? Do you believe with your whole heart? If you have never believed in Jesus Christ... I call you tonight to do the greatest thing that you could ever do in your life. Everything else in your life would be a far distant second at best for you to make the decision to commit your life to Jesus Christ and to believe in your heart that he is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead and that he is the Savior of sinners. That is the greatest decision you could ever make in your life. And just because you come to a conference like this with Christian all around you and Christian music and Christian preaching doesn't mean you're a Christian. You can go sit in a garage. That doesn't make you a car. (laughs) Just being in a church building doesn't make you a Christian. Just being in a church conference doesn't make you a Christian. It is believing in Jesus Christ. So if you've never done that, You're here by divine appointment tonight. This is the goodness of God to bring you here to hear this message. And so I would urge you right now, if you've never done that, in the quietness of your heart, to bow the knee within your heart and say, Lord Jesus, save me. I commit my life to you. I turn away from my sin And I turn to you completely. I am the chief of sinners. Save me. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this survey of saving faith and its fruit. And the fruit is what we talked about under number nine. It's it's so dynamic. It changes your life. It produces good works. Lord, 
what a miracle you have done in us who believe in you. We could have never turned our own hearts towards you. We were too stiff-necked. We were too stubborn. We were too dead in sin until you invaded our lives and just took over. Father, it will take all eternity to express our gratitude to you. In Jesus' name, amen.